So we are considering once again uh, our topic of singing with grace. Colossians 3.16 reads, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So I told you last week that I just kind of had some lingering questions, some things that were that were on my mind regarding congregational singing, questions that uh, have kind of come up because of common church practices around music. And so the first question we asked last week is, should we always sing? And we saw that there are times that are not appropriate for singing. We saw some instances of that in the Scripture. But we also ended up, I thought, on a... Uh, I appreciated the note the Lord had us end on, and that is that the only people that really have reason to sing in this world are those that are the redeemed. It is those... We saw those that... Uh, how the children of Israel, they, you know, there by the willows, they'd hung their harps. They, how can we sing in a strange land? And we saw that even though we are in a strange land, we have much reason for rejoicing and praising our God because unlike them... We've been set free. They were captive in a strange land, but the Lord has set us free. So uh, we dealt with that question, should we always sing? The second question I want to consider today is, should we have a song leader? That's just kind of common practice, right? You have song leaders, but uh, it, should we have song leaders? I, I wanted to consider that because what do we find in the Word of God regarding that? You know, singing takes up, uh, other than preaching, the, mo the rest of our time, uh, the, or what takes up the most time in comparison to preaching is singing, right? So that process and what's involved in that, uh, we want to kind of examine it and ask that question. Should we have a song leader? Lord will, in my intention after we get through with uh, this, uh, with considering this topic of singing, is to move on forward in 1 Timothy where we've been. And in 1 Timothy 3, we have, two, we have the two offices of the church set forth uh, for us. And th that first office that is established is, it's called here in 1 Timothy 3, bishop. It's called an elder. In other places, those terms are synonymous. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And so we begin to go into the quali qualifications of a bishop. And then when we, we skip down a little bit further in verse number 8, it says, likewise must the deacons be grave. So these office, these are the two offices that we have listed in the New Testament church. The office of a bishop or an elder and the office of a deacon. Song leader's not listed in there, is he? Uh, and, and neither of these guys, when you look through the qualifications of these guys, you don't see any reference to music. There are, there's no qualification for them that pertains to music. They've got to be you know, proficient or skilled in that area. So we don't have the office of a song leader specifically listed for us or a minister of music as some might call it. And musical skill is not listed under any of the qualifications of deacons and elders here. So are we out of order to have one who leads the singing? This is just questions that I'm asking, right? Are we out of order? Do we have any biblical basis for that? Could we not just gather together as a group of believers and say, what song do you want to sing? And someone call a song out and we sing that song. And we've done that at times. At times the song leader said, I don't have anything. Anybody got a song? And someone would call out a song and that's what we would sing. Um, could work that way. Yeah, um, but even though we don't have the specific role of a song leader mentioned, it's also not forbidden, right? One thing that we've said over and over again regarding the New Testament structure as far as church order goes is that God gives us a great deal of liberty here. And so we're trying to consider the areas where God says, this is something that is important and is an issue. Um, and we, we, we understand the overarching purpose in all of these things to glorify God, to build up the people of God. Uh, we understand that as we saw in the beginning of that study to, uh, in the beginning of the study to uh, declare sound doctrine, we have that purpose and goal. But we have a lot of liberty in the way in which that is done. So it is not forbidden. It's one of those areas of liberty. We've established very clearly that the church is to sing praises to God. And so for each individually, individual assembly, the way that works out, it might vary. But I want to just kind of consider some guiding principles here that apply. It really, it's general principles that apply to everything, every aspect of our assembling together. I do want you to see, though, before we jump into some of those um, appropriate requirements for a song leader, I want us to see something in Nehemiah's day, Nehemiah chapter 12. We don't have, like I said, anything specific listed in the New Testament. 
as the saints assembled together. But we do have some, some roles in the Old Testament that don't specifically use that term song leader, but you can see that there were individuals that functioned uh, in a leading capacity when it came to music among the assembly. Nehemiah, Nehemiah is one of those I never go to the right place. I always start by looking after uh, looking in the minor prophets and they're not there. They're out of chronological order. Uh, they're before uh, the Psalms, before Job. So Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And in Nehemiah chapter number 12, we see that, um, that song and singing was a big part of the Old Testament church. As, uh, as they gathered together to worship God, uh, the, the things that went on in the temple, the things that went on in the service of God's song was a big part of that. And, and in Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 43... It says, also that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives also and the children rejoiced, so that the joy of Israel was heard even afar off. And singing something that's always accompanying joy as you look in the scriptures. So uh, I, you won't, I wouldn't be surprised just because of the great joy that we read about here to find that they were singing as well. As we read on at that time, there were some appointed over the chambers for the treasures. Uh, for the offerings, for the first fruits, and for the tithes, to gather into them uh, out of the fields of the cities the portions of the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced for the priests and for the Levites that waited. And both the singers and the porters kept the ward of their God and the ward of, of the purification according to the commandment of David and of Solomon his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chief of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving unto God. So this is something that was a, a pattern that was established in David's day. These chief of the singers that he had set up. And all, and all Israel, verse 47, in the days of Zerubbabel, in the days of Nehemiah, gave the portions of the singers and the porters every day his portion. And they sanctified holy things unto the Levites, and the Levites sanctified them unto the children of Israel. So there were those that led in song uh, in Nehemiah's day. It was after the pattern that David had established in his day. And, and as we see at the end of this here, they even received compensation for that which they did. It was an important enough service that they were compensated for that. Uh, go to verse number, chapter number 13. And you see that uh, that compensation for these singers was an issue, a matter of issue between Nehemiah and the and the sinful priest Eliashib. In uh, chapter 13 and verse 4, And before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was called unto Tobiah, and he had prepared for him a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, the new wine, and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priests. So, uh, so this priest, Eliashib, was taking that these tithes that had been given for these purposes, and, and was using it for uh, other purposes. He was making room here for this uh, man, Tobiah, um, and I don't remember all the details behind Tobiah. He was, I, I believe, uh, you know, I'm not, just go back and read and I'm not going to try to go there. Uh, but anyway, he was using it in an unlawful way. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem, Nehemiah says, for then the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Elijah did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God, and it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. There's mention at the beginning of this book about how the Ammonites and the Moabites should not come into the congregation of God forever. And so this guy Tobiah, I can't remember if he was part Jew or what the story is there, but anyway he was in a place that he shouldn't be. And uh, so he cast Tobiah out and I commanded that they cleanse the chambers and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. 
What portions are we talking about? For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. He said these guys should have been given continuously to this, but they were having to find employment outside the temple because they weren't given the tithes that God had prescribed for them. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered, gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasury. So Singing was a big part of the experience in the temple. The, uh, the, there was Singers played a big role there, in so much so that they were compensated for that service. Some believe that there was singing constantly based on some of the passages in the Scripture uh, in the temple, that they had singers that sang day and night. But I, I want you to see uh, in chapter 12 and verse 42, and I specifically uh, didn't read this the first time because this may be one of the best examples of what we might call a song leader in the scriptures. And in 12 and verse 42, and uh, Maasiah, the, the Shemai, and Shemai, I'm sorry, Shemaiah, and Eliezer, and Uzzai, <laughs> and Jehonan, and Jehohanan, and Malachijah, and Elam, and Ezer, whew, and the singers sang loud with Jezrehiah, their what? Overseer. I should have just skipped all those other names and read the last part of the verse, right? That was the point. There was one. There were those that sang loud. There were those that were singers uh, in the temple. And the temple's not fully established here yet, but they're putting things in order. And uh, uh, there was one that was listed as their overseer. He was a leader among the singers. He would have been a song leader. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15. 1 Chronicles 15. It's taken a little bit longer than I wanted to spend, but I do want you to see this in David's day. We read that this was after the pattern of David. And in 1 Chronicles 15, uh, and in verse number 22, we have one, and I'm going to say his name is Kenaniah. And Kenaniah, chief of the Levites, was for song. He instructed about the song because he was skillful. This was a man that was skillful in that area. And this was one that David had, had established as one to instruct others regarding song. In verse number 27, it, it, it gives another description of him. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen and all the Levites that bear the ark and the singers. And Kenaniah, the master of the song with the singers. David also had upon him an ephod of linen. And so Kenaniah here is referred to as master of the song. He was a song leader among the people. He was one that was skilled in that area. And David had established as one to lead the people regarding music and song. So another verse you might want to look up on your own time, 2 Chronicles 23, 23, speaks of those who taught to sing praise. And if you look up the meaning of that word, it's rendered taught to sing praise in the King James, but it literally means led in singing Praises. So even though we don't have a New Testament equivalent office that's specifically established, we don't have reason to reject those that lead in music, and we do find that pattern among the Old Testament saints. So, song leader, if it's appropriate according to the need of a given conversation, my question regarding the song leader is what might we infer to be the requirements of a song leader? What are some basic principles uh, that would apply to song leaders? Those who lead, and this is just a general principle really, but those who lead in the church in any capacity, song leaders included, should possess the Spirit of God. In other words, they should have evidence of true salvation, right? They should have evidence of true salvation. We looked at this uh, when we considered the topic of prayer, and I don't know if you remember it or not, but let's just read it quickly in Jude. In Jude verse number 19, Jude verse number 19, uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, we've gone back over and over again to this point that uh, let everything be done unto edification that we've seen in 1 Corinthians 14. So we want to build the church up, right? Uh, the church ought to be edified. The, you want to decide whether or not we should do this among the assembly of the saints? Well, will it edify the church? Because everything ought to be done unto edification. So in verse number 19, we have these that separate themselves. They are sensual, and what do they not possess? They don't have the Spirit, right? They have not the Spirit of God. But in contrast to that, ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for it, so on and so on. The point is, if you're going to build the church up, it's got to be, uh, it, it's something that happens as those who lead among the church are being led by the Spirit of God. Those that don't have the Spirit of God, tear down. Those that have the Spirit of God will build up and edify the people. And, and so here we applied it to praying, but the same principle applies everywhere. Those that are in leadership roles among the people of God should possess the Spirit of God. Never put anyone in a leading role among the church without clear evidence of salvation. You don't do that. You're asking for trouble. You're going to have issues. You're, you're asking for division because that individual can't think the way that God thinks because he doesn't have the Spirit of God. The church has the mind of Jesus Christ, right? Right. And so you want decisions that are made within the congregation to be made by those that possess the Spirit of God. What's convenient is not always what's best. And I say this because in the area of music, this is an area where a lot of churches drop the ball. Because they put people in these positions based on their skill and not based on the evidence of the Spirit of God in their lives. So what's convenient isn't always best. And let me tell you, when you've got somebody in that role, it's in any role like that, it's much harder to get them out when it becomes clear you may have been too hasty. One of the things we're going to see with uh, the, the bishops, the elders, when we look at those qualifications is that, I, that idea that they, needn't, they shouldn't be a novice, right? You don't lay your hands suddenly on anybody. Uh, there should be examination for a time to make sure that you see that clear evidence of salvation. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. I told you we're not going to be able to go through church order without repeatedly coming back to this chapter. And uh, uh, so how ought singing to be done according to 1 Corinthians 14? And we've said this, but I want you to see that singing is included in, in these uh, areas of church order that are listed in 1 Corinthians 14. In verse 15 it says, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. We looked at this when we considered prayer, that prayer should be understandable. It should be that which is profitable and beneficial. Here he was talking about speaking in unknown tongues. He says that doesn't profit and benefit the church. That doesn't build up the church. Well, not just praying is included in that, but he also says I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So music that happens in the church should be for the edification of the people. The point should be understood. The, the, the truth should be evident and clear and so those that are choosing those songs need to be men that are full of the Spirit of God so that that singing is indeed done with the Spirit and with understanding also. It needs to be led by the Spirit of God and with the skill also to make it meaningful to those who hear. Why ought it to be that way? Well that's our next point. A song leader uh, is responsible to choose songs that exalt Christ and set forth sound doctrine for the edification of the church. Look at Luke 24. Luke 24. What are the requirements? What's the responsibility of a song leader? Well the requirement is it should be an individual that's full of the Holy Spirit. And the, and the responsibility is to lead in songs that will exalt the Lord Jesus and will, will clearly set forth sound doctrine uh, unto the edification of the church. Luke 24 and verse number 44, the Lord Jesus here, our, our brother just led us not too long ago in studying this passage. And in verse 44, he said unto them, Jesus said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which was written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the what? In the Psalms concerning who? Me, Me right? So the, the, the point to the Psalms is, set, uh, is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. They were written concerning Him. And so singing should glorify the Lord. It should set forth Christ and exalt Him among us. Not exalt men. Right? Exalt the Lord Jesus. 
And Jesus said that was the point to the Psalms and all of the Scripture. And so that should be the point in our song service. Amen? And then uh, it, it should set forth that sound doctrine unto the edification of the church. And I, I'm sorry, I should have told you to hold your place in 1 Corinthians, but because we've already seen that 1 Corinthians 14 deals with this topic of singing, then we understand that what he says in verses uh, 12 and 26 also apply to singing. Uh, verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 14, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. The songs that are sung should build up the church upon the most holy face. It should edify the people of God. Verse 26, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a what? A song. You all have a song. See, he's going to include singing in this thought. All of you have a song and you have a doctrine and you have a tongue and you have a revelation and you have an interpretation. He says you need to hold, put on the brakes and you need to step back and say, why are we doing what we're doing? It should be done. All things should be done unto edifying. Everything we do here is to have the goal of glorifying the Lord and edifying the church. And so one that is leading in, in song is responsible for that, choosing those songs that are unto that end. Maybe this goes without saying because we said it was one that possesses the Spirit. So one full of the Spirit of God is going to be making choices along that lines. But I just wanted you to see how singing is mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 14 and it's tied specifically to that thought that these things should be done unto edification. Songs for public wor worship should be picked that will edify the saints that are biblical, that are sound doctrinally, right? And that were beneficial to the hearers. Uh, what we see here in verse 26 also is that in the Corinthian church that, you know, everybody thought they had to do something. Everybody came and I want to sing, right? And, and you get this idea that they're really setting themselves forth instead of setting Christ forth. And so part of the role of the song leader then is to make sure regarding singing that these things are done decently and in order, right? That, that, that things are limited as they, all, as they need to be here so that the church is edified. Look at 27 through 33. Again, we read this uh, with some of our past thoughts, but I want to point out the limiting terms that, that's in this passage right here. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at most by three, and that by course, that in order. There needs to be some order there. There needs to be some limiting there. Uh, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and not to God. Why? Because it's all supposed to edify the church. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything uh, be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one. See the order that's established there and the limiting nature of this that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets for God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints. So there is an order and that's what the last verse says. Let all things be done decently and in order. So in the area of song, a song leader needs to make sure that these things are done decently and in order, they're, that they're limited to the degree that they need to be so that the church is edified and built up by that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, by the way, I want you to see that the song leader is not the only one responsible in this area, right? Because the Apostle Paul's writing to the whole church and he said, how is it that you guys all want to put on a show, right? How is it that all of you, when you come together, I've got a song to sing. It's not just the song leader's job, right? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we all have a responsibility here uh, that, that we should not be striving to put ourselves forward, um, but that attitude of kindness and a desire that others go first, right? Uh, the song leader, go, though, is, it, it's, it seems that uh, one in that role would assist in these things and making sure that the singing portion of the service is done decently and in order. Um, the last point I wanted to make this morning, do we even have time? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get through this quickly. This is back to our first point regarding the song leader, but the song leader should be one that possesses the Spirit of God and should exalt Christ in the songs that are chosen, making sure that the church is edified, that sound doctrine is set forth. Well, also in this responsibility, those that lead singing need to uh, make sure before they give over the reins to someone else to sing among the church that they also have that evidence of salvation. 
Why is that important? Do you guys remember what we said, uh, what we read in our text, that uh, uh, when, we're, when we're using these psalms and these hymns and these spiritual songs, what we're supposed to be doing with these things? We're supposed to be teaching and admonishing one another, right? So if in the song service, if we're turning over the singing uh, to somebody that's going to do a solo or whatever, and we have no idea what kind of song they're going to pick or what, who they're going to set forth. Are they going to set forth themselves? Or are they going to be glorifying the Lord? That's a big deal because you teach through song, right? Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, you teach and admonish, admonish one another through that. And uh, this goes back to the point I was making earlier. This area of music is maybe the easiest place to put an unbeliever in a role within the assembly of the saints. And it's always a bad idea. That's always about it. And the reason this happens is because people are looking for musical ability. They make that the priority, and that is not the priority. The priority is the glory of God, the edification of the saints, right? And so uh, there's nothing wrong with identifying individuals that have skill in this area. Uh, there's plenty of places in the Scripture that talk about that. I, I read uh, Psalm 33.3 at one point that talked about playing skillfully the song before the Lord. Uh, uh, so skill ought to be a part of it. Uh, look at 2 Chronicles 34. Let's, let's go over to, to the Chronicles real quick and just read a couple of passages. I'm not saying that we're against finding those that are skilled, right, in this area. I'm just saying that is not, first and foremost, the issue. That is not the priority. When Josiah set things in order in the temple in his day... Look at what it says in 2 Chronicles 34 and verse number 12. And the men did the, over, did the work faithfully, and the overseers of them were Jahath and Obadiah, uh, the Levites of the sons of Merari, and Zechariah and Meshullam of the sons of the Kohathites to set it forward, and other of the Levites, all that could skill of instruments of music. So they didn't just randomly pick Levites. They, were, they picked individuals that were skilled in this area. It reads kind of weird in the King James, but the Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge notes regarding this word skill here. It says this verb skill is now obsolete. Uh, obsolete. The meaning is everyone who is skillful on instruments of music. Uh, go to 2 Chronicles 5 while we're here. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. This is an easy er area uh, to introduce people in roles where they're really leading in the services. Um, uh, but they don't know the Lord, and that's never a good thing. But skill that does play its part. Look at 2 Chronicles 5 and verse number 12. It says, And the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. It came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voices with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praise the Lord saying for he is good for his mercy endureth forever that then the house was filled with a cloud even the house of the Lord God was pleased with their effort here listen this uh, uh, coming together and the trumpeters and the singers being as one to make one sound to be heard and praise it listen that doesn't happen without practice and skill right so there's nothing wrong with practice and there's nothing wrong with skill in this area, but that can't be the, the main reason for choosing individuals in those capacities. Uh, there was skill involved in that, and David chose those that were skilled in that area. But David understood something. First Chronicles 25. First Chronicles 25. And um, you know what? Uh... This is just another verse that shows that those that uh, uh, the number of them with their brethren that were instructed in the songs of the Lord, even all that were cunning, was two hundred fourscore and eight. So they were skilled and they were cunning. In other words, they understood. They they were accomplished in that area. They were trained in that area. But what is the primary responsibility if you're going to be teaching in song? Then there needs to be those that are handling that that are. Believers, right? And, and I want to just close with Acts chapter 6 to show you how important this is in every aspect of the congregation of God. 
You say, well, they're just singing a song. And maybe they're singing a song, you know, that's, that, that you know, is in our hymn book already. Is, is that really a big deal? If it's involving the church of Jesus Christ, yes, it is a big deal. There's not a task that's too small. Look at uh, Acts chapter 6 and in verse number 3. Now, if you remember the context here, the widows have been neglected. So we're going to choose men among you. And, and Peter said, what their job is going to be is to serve tables. That's a pretty menial task, right? Uh, they, they, that's, that's low on the totem pole of things. They're just going to serve tables. But listen to what the requirements were for these individuals that were chosen to serve tables. Verse number 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, wisdom who we may appoint over this business. If it's involving the church, there's no such thing as a small task. People, they better be believers. Choose men that are full of the Holy Ghost to see to this. And so I would, I would set forth before you that the same applies to music in the church. We should have those that are leading in the congregation and teaching in song. They better be saved. They better know the Lord. You don't put someone forward just because they have some skill in that area. It's been grievous to me to go into other churches and to talk to people afterwards that were involved in the music service and you talk to those individuals and you hear everything about, everything in the world other than Jesus Christ, right? Their, their minds are focused on everything else and there seems to be no evidence of a sincere walk with the Lord. That ought not be. If it if it's involves the assembly of, of the Lord Jesus, there should be those chosen that possess the Spirit of God. And even in regards to serving tables, Peter said this is important. 